This program is made possible by annual financial support from viewers like you. Now, more of us live with cats than live with dogs. And yet, when the cat was domesticated three and a half thousand years ago in ancient Egypt, our relationship with the dog was already of long standing. Our ancestors, who were hunter-gatherers, had domesticated the dog some 10,000 years ago. But the cat, the much more sensible cat, waited until we were domesticated, waited until we'd invented towns and there was scavengeable waste for them to come in and take from us. And really, they've been exploiting us ever since. And they live around us and have worked for us on farms and around our buildings. And then, around 150 years ago, more and more people began to live with cats in a totally different way. They became pets. And the relationship has grown ever since. And now, of course, the cat in the status of pet is the sort of top animal at this end of the 20th century. As the cat's role changed to pet, so our relationship became closer. While your cat can convey the essence of contentment and trust, yet it can also show its family's wildness. This apparent contradiction makes it the most enigmatic of animals. And it was the enigmatic and serene qualities that the ancient Egyptians portrayed in the statues of early domestic cats qualities we still see in our cats today. The origins of the cat have been one of those mysteries that have beset people who've had any interest in them at all for centuries. Where did the cat come from? How did it start? Where was it domesticated? Well, this wonderful enigmatic animal that's kept that story tied up a mystery for centuries. Hello, what's that? Why you don't burn your wrist? Is what's behind this. In the last century, some wonderful bronzes started to come out of Egypt. And when you look at this animal here, and the neatness with which a cat can sit, you realize that the sculptors of pieces like this knew a lot about the cat. They were familiar with the cat. And it's that very completeness of the essence of cat in the sculptor's mind, which tells us that when these started to be made, then people had already stopped thinking of the lioness as the fertility goddess Bastet of ancient Egypt, and had come to terms with the small cat. And that's why we think that the point of domestication was three and a half thousand years ago, because at that point onwards, we start to see things like these bronzes, and we begin to see wall paintings, and eventually we start seeing mummified small cats. So it's looking at this very animal that gives us that idea. And yet, why was it so important? If you look back through the records, we know from a writer at the time, Herodotus, that 700,000 people used to attend the annual celebrations of the female cat fertility deity, Bastet, the cat goddess. And if you can imagine that, 700,000, that must have been the bulk of the population of Egypt at the time. And most of the people going along were shaking these rattles. And this is a sistra. It's an object of veneration that you shake to simulate the lovemaking. Because the one thing that the people knew about cats was that they went in for lovemaking in a big way. So the fertility deity is very much at the seat of Bastet. Yet for much of our combined histories, the cat has been a working animal. But not without taking rests. It was Harrison Weir who changed cats' lives. He invented cat shows, the first held in 1871. And cats have been on display ever since. Originally, the domestic cat was found just in the Middle East, while today, it lives in large numbers throughout the world and is treasured by cat lovers 
everywhere. If you love cats, but don't particularly like dogs, then the chances are when you describe a dog, you'll talk in terms of a sycophantic animal. Whereas somebody who is a dog owner but doesn't like cats will talk of the wonderfully loyal dog. Those same two people, if they talked about a cat, the anti-cat person would talk in terms of nasty standoffish animal. Whereas the person who loves cats is going to talk in terms of the enigmatic, independent animal. It's the same animal in both cases. It's how we perceive the same behavior. And so it's remarkable that our behavior as well can interrelate with these two denizens of our household as well as it does, that we all get on as well as we do. Because the ancestry of the dog and the cat couldn't be further apart. The ancestry of the dog through the wolf is of an animal that hunts as a pack, hunts as a group, and as a result of that, have to have a hierarchy sorted out beforehand. They can't just sort of come to the kill and decide who's going to be in first, second, or third. Everybody knows know exactly where they are. So there's a top dog, second dog, and third dog, and so on. But in the world of the cats, in ancient times, the whole of the evolution of the cat family was originally in forest lands. You can't hunt as a group then because you bump into things. So it's the solitary life of the cat when it's the hunter. So when cats do come together, they come together in groups for things like mating and rearing young and so on. And we see that around any farmstead where you'll see groups of cats there together or semi-feral cats, stray cats, where you get this same reenaction of the early days of the cat. And when you look at those, you don't see the real aggression there sorting things out. What you see, you could use the word affection. And the world of the cat is because it is based on that affection, lets us in by using the same sort of thing. When we respond to a cat, we use gentle terms, we use affectionate terms, and the cat becomes bonded with us. If we become aggressive with a cat, it doesn't fit in. But the reverse is very often easily said for the dog, that by being firm, the dog knows where it should be. So remarkably, the two aspects of our character allow us to fit into their lives. My cat sees me as some sort of cat. And realistically, I must admit that I'm bound to see him as some sort of person. The amazing thing is that given that we are different species, that we are both able to use the same area. Because by being recognized as some sort of cat, I'm able to be incorporated into this whole concept of cat ranges. Um, if you never go into your back garden and you never do as I do. I mean, I often will go out, sit down, take a cup of tea, and it seems to be a purely frivolous activity, but not from the cat's point of view. What's happening is that I'm using the land. I'm declaring my ownership, not by fences, but by usage. And by sitting here and being here, I'm using what's known as the core area, because this is where he and I overlap in our usage of the land. And it's the same sort of thing, if not just drinking tea, but we all know when we go out into the garden and do any work there at all, we very often talk in terms of the curious cat coming up to see what we're doing. But of course, it's exactly the same sort of thing. I'm going out, I am using the land, and therefore I'm declaring that I've got a right to be here. And the cat coming along and sitting beside me will have that shared right to be there. So whenever we do a spot of weeding in our gardens, our cat will appear as a companion, gaining territorial confidence by our presence. The hunting cat, all alert in its range, will just as readily play with us as chase prey and follow us around our common range in our garden. The more we use our garden, the more our cat will feel it owns the area as its range, as part of our common overlapping ranges. The same is true inside the house, where the cat has the core of its overlapping range with us. 
the jungle of our houses, are not such strange places for our cats. Domestic living has hardly changed their territorial life. When you're out with your cat in the garden, look around and watch very carefully what's happening. Now, this is my own cat, Leroy, and I'm used to following him. And I'm sure you must have seen that he was rubbing against here. He wasn't just coming and sitting down. And the reason that cats do that is because they have scent glands under here, as well as having some on the top of their head and down on their tail. And as they move against something like that, they leave a scent message and another cat can come along and detect that it is them that have left it before. And so you get this system with cats, whereas a cat will go around, it will mark and go on, and it will have to come back and recheck and reinvestigate the marks that it's left. And by marking like this, these little low-key events, it can leave a territorial route around its range. And by doing that, it can assert its right to be there. It does other things as well, of course. It will spray and so on. But this rather quiet piece of activity, just a gentle rub, is very important. Sometimes it's against something like that that sticks out. Equally, it can be just against odd branches that seem so imperceptible. As you walk along, you can develop a cat's eye and see the sort of things that a cat would rub against and leave messages and check. If you watch your cat very carefully as it works its way along these scent sticks, you'll notice that some it will seem to go into a curious trance with its mouth slightly agape and focusing inwardly somewhere. What it's doing is tasting scent. It's got an organ just above the roof of its mouth which it can draw the air into. And it's not tasting as we mean taste. And it's not smelling. It's able to do a curious combination of both. And by that, it can interpret all sorts of information about the state of the other cats that have been wandering around and so can really read its territory. What that cat has just done here is try to assert its right to be there. It's a neuter tom, and it's not resident. It's the cat from next door, and it knows it's not on its own patch. And so under the stress of being here, it's trying to spray. It can't give a proper spray because it hasn't got the levels of sex hormones to make that strong aroma, but it's going through all the positions. Its tail is up, it's juddering away, and it's far more like normal urination than the volume that's coming through but nonetheless, from the cat's point of view, because of the pressure, it's really trying to say, I've got a right to be here. Back in its own patch, it won't do that. But here, it certainly is. I'm sure you're familiar with this piece of behavior where your cat is paddling away on your chest at the same time as purring very loudly. Thank you, Tabitha. Yes. And in essence, if you wish to understand your cat, where else could you look but this? Because it's the most essential piece of cat behavior. It's the heart of the cat. If you look at what they're doing when they're paddling, they're behaving as if they're kittens. Now, Tabitha here is about five and a half years old, so there's no way, by any stretch of the imagination, you're a kitten, are you? No. But nonetheless, she's still behaving as if she is a kitten. And when you look at the size difference between me and her, it's easy to understand why. Because I'm the size that her mother was when she was a kitten. We bring this out in our cats. My great big lap relative to her, with all the warmth that goes up into her, is very reassuring. So of course she settles down and starts paddling away, just as she used to at a mother's peak when she was trying to stimulate that milk flow. But the other thing which is really at that complete heart of 
understanding your cat is the purr. What is a purr? How is it made? Why do cats purr? If you think about it, people don't purr. Cows don't purr. Dogs don't purr. And you need to look as much at those other animals to understand why the cat purrs. It is a very, very unusual piece of behavior. In fact, the understanding of how it even happens, people still debate whether it's blood flows through or under the diaphragm. Well, we discount that now. Obviously, we say now, obviously, as we change our ideas, it's something to do with the larynx. I think, personally, it's, it's the outer part of the larynx, because when the kitten is suckling away on the mother's teeth, it can make that sound with that part of the larynx with its mouth completely full. So that's a very good contender for how, but why? Well, again, it's back to kittenhood, even when we've got this relationship of a person with a cat. It's reliving part of that kittenhood. When you're a kitten, you're leading a life which is different to that of a cow or a dog or a person. Because the male cat, which we always think of as idle, who does nothing, he goes out, he defends territory. Fine. But he doesn't come back with food for the young kittens, and he certainly doesn't take shifts at looking after the kittens. All the workload is down to the mother cat. And so therefore that mother cat, if she's disturbed by anything near her, has to look after the kittens, she has to go out, get the food, leave the kittens alone. Everything about the mother cat and the kittens is almost against the world. And so what they need is some clue, some signal that can operate between the cat that can be low key, very quiet, reassuring, and settle the kittens down. So when the mother leaves them, they purr to each other, it's reassuring, we all stay together as a group. When mum comes back, mum purrs, and they purr, and it's reassuring, and we all keep quiet, and the rest of the world doesn't know about it. And the wonderful thing is for the human-cat relationship, that reassurance is there with us. It's not just contentment, it's reliving kittenhood. Yes. One of the great things about a cat is that you don't have to take it for a walk. You don't have to show it how far it can go. You don't need to draw any territorial limitations. Because unlike dogs or gerbils, we can allow the cat to just wander out into the outside world. It has its own very definite territorial limits. Although in this garden there is a hedge over there, and Mr. Jones lives beyond, and you've got the same arrangement on the other side, it's not really the hedge that's the limitation for the cat. Because when you think in terms of territory, it's really about defense. And what's the other side of that hedge is Mr. Jones' own cat. And they've come to an agreement as to where one territory starts and the next finishes. But there's also something else called a home range, and they're not quite the same. We often speak of territories and ranges as if they were the same thing. But they're not. A range is the area of land that a cat or any other animal needs to provide enough food to support itself. So if you're a cat living miles from anywhere in north of Scotland and you're living wild, then you really have to hunt over a big area. If you're in London and you're doing the same sort of thing, there's far more food available for you, so you don't need such an area. And a cat like this living in a suburban area gets so much food virtually forced down its throat, it hardly needs any size of garden at all. And yet, having said that, a tomcat like this one will have a range about 10 times the area of an adjacent queen or female cat. Now, why should that be? I know he's a big cat, but he's not 10 times bigger than the adjacent queen. No, it's for social reasons. And what happens is that toms range out over an area within which their queens, if they're part of a group, they can be protective to that area and give those queens a safer area to bring up their young. Now, the strange thing is that when cats live with us, they don't change their behavior. It's just if you've got a tom in an area, he will look around and see what the size of the adjacent queen's uh, ranges are and then set his size accordingly. Feral or gone wild cats may live near us, but then support themselves largely by scavenging. Each queen's area will partly overlap with those of others in her group. The much larger range of a tom encompasses the queen's ranges. And although he does not directly provide food for their kittens, 
the Tom's larger range protects the females from other cats. The same basic pattern is true of our domestic living house cats, as they claim their ranges in our gardens, except that they behave towards us as if we are cats with ranges. The queens overlap their ranges with us, and so use our gardens. Toms overlap their ranges with their owners, but also cover a number of queens' ranges. Unfortunately for the Toms, queens identify with their owners as if they are members of their own cat group. So, poor old Toms are made to feel a little like outsiders in the domestic landscape. However big or small your garden is, the chances are that your cat will not use all of it. And yet, in his movements around, scent will be extremely important, but not always in the most obvious ways. For example, if Sylvester did not live here, the chances are that the neighboring cats on either side would use this garden as a communal latrine, because they tend to scent mark by digging holes and leaving their dung as a means of declaring the edges of their territory. And if you've got a dispute between a couple of toms, then they may not even bury their droppings, their feces. They may leave them prominently sighted. And so in that sense, scent becomes a very important part of what's going on. But there are other things as well. Sylvester spends a lot of time snoozing. He's quite an elderly cat. But cats of all ages do exactly the same thing. Because unlike a dog, in hot weather, they can't just run around and then flop down, panting away. Their means of controlling their temperature is to not get too hot in the first place. So fine, they'll have warming spots where they can bask in the sun, but then they'll move to a shady spot. And this moving around means that they have very definite places that they go to, and each of these gains the scent of their fur, so other cats, again, know they're around. But there's also an even more curious way that the cat's scent gets around, because the fur means that the cat can't sweat through its skin. It wouldn't function very well like that. How the cat loses some of its heat and some of its scent as a result is through its paws. They are slightly sweaty and therefore slightly smelly. So when your cat goes around and claws on a fence and marks it and leaves a, a spot where another cat can come along and check, it also leaves a residual scent as well. So your cat may be using a tree, but it may also be going along the top of a fence and clawing away. Or outside your house, you may have straw matting. The cat may use that. All sorts of places in and around your house, the cat will be leaving scent. We all know how cows will change their position from lying down or standing up, depending on how the weather's going to be. And similarly, we understand how cats change their behavior when there's likely to be a change in the weather. We often use the expression, oh, the cat's got the wind up its tail, when there's a gust of wind around. But what we can understand today, and what people thought in the past, are two totally different things. You see, we can sort out cause and effect, but that hasn't always been as clear. I mean, here's a, a natural barometer, if you like, of how the weather conditions change. A, a pine cone, when it's going to be dry conditions, then it's nice and open. And when it's wet, it's fairly tight and closed. And we can understand that relates to exactly how the weather is now, not in the future. The poor old cat's problem was that it seemed to be seeing into the future. And if you're doing that in medieval times or later, 
that seemed to be that you were in league with the devil, you had uncanny powers. What the cat did, and I'm sure you may have seen this yourself, was when the weather is changing and the skies are darkening, it would rub over its ear into this little dip just down there. Yes, down there. There you are, little one. It must be the least washed part of a cat's body, because although it will rub everywhere else, that bit it seems to reserve just for when the weather is going to go into rain. Now, why should it be so? And it can do this for even up to 24 hours ahead before the skies have even changed. Well, of course, barometers do that. They can detect pressure changes, and within our ears, as well as the cat's ears, we've got the facility to do that. The great thing about the cat is, of course, that it has the ability to show that it can detect it. Whether the cat acts on it, we don't know, but that it showed it meant, of course, that it was suspicious, and that just increased the probability that it was in league with witchcraft, devilry, and everything evil. When cats meet and greet, there's a body language going on which they understand. And if you use your eyes, you can get into that world yourself. Look how your cat greets you. The tail pops up. And when you rub along their back, as we always do when we meet our cats, we're helping to reinforce this hello as they rub around. And so we've got a, a sort of mutual friendship and admiration society going on. But there's another aspect to the cat's way of life and how it uses that body language. When that tail fluffs up dramatically in that full way, and they arch that back, then you can either have a defending cat or an aggressive cat. You all know that sound. But look what's going on. Look at the ears. Who's the aggressor? If they're just going down flat to the head, then that's an animal that's going into a defensive posture. But if they're going down flat, but with a kink, so you can see the top back of the ears to the front, then that's the aggressor. It seems so similar, but to the cat, it's totally different. Look also at the eyes. In the defending cat, the eyes are wide open with terror. But in the aggressor, they are tight shut with its forward movement, threatening posture. And that posture is so important. The aggressor goes sideways on. It looks larger. Its head is turning as it's ready to throw itself onto that other cat. The defending cat, who's really worried, will go down on its back, and as the aggressor comes on top, it will rake with its back paws on the underside. And you'll get that so familiar as they fight. <laughs> the defender's ears are flattened back. The aggressors are rotated, so their backs are seen from the front. He moves around at an angle, waiting for his chance to leap on. The aggressor's tail agitates. The defender stays on her back, ready to rake and kick. The defender breaks off. The point having been made, the aggressor does not push it unnecessarily, with a needless risk of injury to himself. And ruffled fur settles down. In adult life, the cat's hunting ability comes to the fore. As a kitten, Leroy learnt about hunting, and now he's incredibly efficient. The worm that was caught by the early bird was grabbed by Leroy at the same split second that he caught the fledgling as it was being fed by its parent. Many cat lovers are upset when their cat brings home a bird, but the reality is that cats catch very few birds in comparison to their number of animals like mice. A game of nerve develops 
between predator and prey. We think that the cat is just playing with the prey instead of getting on and killing it. But the cat is trying to avoid being injured, as some prey have sharp teeth. So it allows it to try to escape, to see how subdued the prey is. Catch and recapture goes on. Leroy is suddenly displaced from his prey by Tabitha, but she was not trained in kittenhood to hunt, so does not really know what to do. The bird wisely remains frozen. As Tabitha has taken the bird, so we do when our cat brings one home. Yet cats still bring prey back to their patch, where they best know the terrain. In a feral group, or among garden cats, they stand to lose their prey to those other cats. But a great advantage is that learning doesn't completely stop at kittenhood. So although she's not as good as Leroy, Tabitha has learnt something about prey by Leroy's bringing prey back. So group skills and survival improves. But the policy of remaining stock still has worked for the young robin. From time to time, it sneaks a look, even when Leroy is back on scene. It waits for its opportunity to escape. Flown to freedom, not an uncommon result, which is why it really is a two-sided, if macabre, game. But it's not all over. The cat, who was only an onlooker, carefully checks out the scenes of the action, reliving in its mind Leroy's hunt. It's hard to beat having a cat gym in your house for bringing entertainment both into your cat's life and into yours. And just think how important it is, particularly if you have a cat, which is a housebound cat. Think what you're doing. You're depriving the cat of the ability to get up. Because most of the time we say to cats, get down off the table, or get down off that sofa. And yet the very heart of a cat is saying, get up, clamber up those trees, chase after those birds. And so to have something like this, which is a cat's own personal place, is wonderful. They can get up with a total secure knowledge that that's okay. And it's also something else, because in this direct communication of play that you can have with your cat, the cat also knows it's a place where you play with them. So they can ask, in effect, to play with you by getting up there. And before we get too pompous about how we're extending the play part of a cat's life and therefore getting them back into kittenhood, of course, that's exactly what we're doing ourselves. When we are playing, we are reliving both of us, our juvenile past, and it's good for us. <laughs> there is a joy in play for its own sake, but in kittenhood, play is a rehearsal for the adult world. It's common in young mammals, particularly in social ones or carnivores like cats. If our cats grow up without these playful interactions with kittens or humans, they're less able to socialize in later life. But for us, there are few things more endearing than playing with kittens. These kittens discovered in their play the moves they'll use in adult territorial fights before they were weaned. Then they began to practice hunting actions. But now, at 12 weeks old, they have the full spectrum of play to employ as they rush and clamber about. But although we normally see play as a social event, the young cat will focus on pretend play by itself. Play largely fades in adult life, but even alone, adults will still play. 
yet playing with your adult cat will increase this part of its activities. As it pursues pretend prey, you keep its kittenish interest and strengthen your mutual bond. watching PBS. This program is made possible by annual financial support from viewers like you. Kittens are undeniably cute and endearing animals. Of course, they do grow up, and that is one of the problem. I am at a Cats Protection League shelter where a lot of cats are brought each year because people no longer want them, and then they have young in the summertime, and of course then there's a lot of kittens who need homes. At this shelter, there's also rabbits, and there's ducks, there's all sorts of things brought in. It's lovely to see them. It's just a pity that people get fed up with animals. It's impossible to believe that anyone could get fed up with you, though, isn't it? You're so cute. You're lovely. But one of the things that, as these animals go through their kitten development, they will go through very definite stages until they reach that point that they're weaned and they can go off to their new homes. Now, of course, when kittens are young, they're like little blobs when they're first born. They've hardly got any senses. This one's eyes are already well open, but when they're initially born, the eyes aren't open at all. And the hearing doesn't really come in until about five days old. And so they're totally dependent on mum. And all this is an advantage because it means they keep very close. They keep into that nest. They keep in with mum and keep warm. And it's only when their eyes start opening at sort of five to 10 days old, they begin to start looking around, but even then, the eyes are still cloudy. Now, in these little kittens here, come out and have a little look. Yes, you come out and have a little look. There we go. They're at a stage that they're already beginning to start to get out of the nest and have a look around. And so when you're looking at cats, come on then, come on then, come on then. These little ones here are sort of two to three weeks old. They start to move, they begin to wander, but their eyes are still very, very cloudy. They don't have full information on the world. And in their movements, although their tummies are no longer stuck to the ground, they are off the ground, look at the difference between the walking of these and the walking of this one next door. He's only just that little bit older. The ones over here, let's pop you back in so you don't get lost. The ones from the nest alongside are at about four and a half to five weeks old. And already the alertness, the larger size, the bigger ears, all of this tells you you're dealing with animals that are that much more capable of dealing with the world because they're getting more information about the world back into them. Yes, Squeaker, let's pop you back in the nest. Wee -ee -ee. Now, at this sort of age, let's see some of you others, shall we? Let's see some of you others. Come on. Yes, lovely. At this sort of age, you've got cats that are almost ready to take on the world, aren't you? And they're taking it on in a playful way. With each of their litter mates, they will react towards each other in a very playful bouncing and batting and patting. It's all larger than life. The movements are still very shaky as they walk. They're beginning to clamber onto things, as you saw the one come out here. And when they play with each other, it's all this sort of crash, bang, wallop. But again, just go on from a few more weeks from now, when they get to seven weeks old and they become weaned, then 
everything suddenly will change from these really endearing little kittens now. The type of play they'll have then will be much more about pursuit. It'll be taking on things like prey. They'll be wanting to go around. So how they play with each other will be, in a way, how they play with prey, how they play with adult cats. It's the learning, getting ready for the adult life. But here, well, it's just cute. Kittens, as they go through their stages of development, go through what are known as sensitive periods. Come on, little one. You've finished your suckle now, haven't you? Yeah. These ones are at about four and a half weeks old. And at this time in their lives, they suddenly undergo quite a major transformation. Now, the mother cat, if she's got access to the outside world, will start to bring in prey. This is a mouse that one of the cats around here brought in last night. Are you interested in that? Are you interested in that? Not necessarily, because you're only just beginning to learn about it. This is the first time you've ever met something like this. You know, there's interest there. And what I'm doing is pretty much what the mother will do. She will act as a competing kitten. So rather than bring in and instruct, she will take something and try to take it away. And over the next few weeks, what will happen is that she will bring in progressively more lively prey until the prey isn't at all damaged. And by doing that, the kittens at the right stages will have learnt the appropriate responses. Now, this has an implication for us as well because the kittens need to be able to know what is live and what is dead fairly early on. And the nest area is a safe haven that the mother sets aside. And the biology works on the principle that if the mother is there, then all is safe. And the kittens can be brought up safely there, so they trust whatever is there. If we handle kittens early enough, then they will trust us. I mean, this is such a strange system that even if by chance a rabbit or a rat has always lived in the nest area, then they will have always been accepted as littermates. So if we want to be accepted ourselves as littermates in our cat's lives, so they will be at ease with us for the rest of their lives, then it's important that we are there before this prey-catching stage in the earlier time. And therefore, that means that even when kittens are two, three weeks old, there ought to be somebody at a cattery who's handling them gently in the nest area. It seems like an intrusion, but by doing that, it means that the cats, for the rest of their lives, will always be happier with people. And that's important, because we forget we are a strange species to the cat. This is a Sumatran tiger. It's one of the rarest big cats in the world. And you might think it's a small cat, but of course, that's what a Sumatran is. It's not the big Siberian tiger. But as a Sumatran tiger, it is severely endangered because one of the problems with so many cats in the world, the wild cats, they have fared very badly by their contact with us. And in complete contrast, our own domestic cat is the cat that has thrived on contact with us. It's almost an irony that as our contact has done well for one, it's pushed the others almost to the point of extinction. And sadly, for the poor old Sumatran, it's so close to the point of extinction, it needs all the help that the zoos of the world, like the London Zoo, can give it. And there are now some 200 of these in captivity, but only 400 alive in the wild. So whilst we must all work towards the protection of animals like the Sumatran, at the same time, we can only admire the great success of our own small cat. Because if you are the prey of our domestic tabby, you will be just as in awe of it as we are of tigers. Both are the superb, supreme carnivores. Very few people go to the trouble of going for a walk with their cats in the woods. But if you do, you suddenly realize how superbly designed they are for the woodland hunting life. In low vegetation, cat's whiskers bring them instant information. 
the pads on each paw tell of the texture underfoot so they can adjust their walking noiselessly. Their slit-shaped pupils let them readily adjust from the bright outside to the woodland gloom, where they're most alert. They frequently investigate the scents left by cats and other animals. Come on, then. I rattle my keys, which produce a high-pitched sound that they Come easily on, home on. in on. Come on, Come on, the hunter has forward-facing eyes and short, powerful jaws to immobilize prey. Their feet walk in line with side position shoulder blades. But when they run in short sprints, the flexibility of their spine shows, so their stride length can increase in a chase. Yet most of the time, it's the sounds and scent that draws the attention of the patrolling cat to prey. tentative paw is often used before a bite, as the cat itself doesn't wish to get bitten. Voles and mice are the most usual prey of cats. When it comes to the capture of voles in grass, the ears home in on the exact position, and a pounce stuns the prey. Cats are the ultimate nighttime hunters. Their senses are finely attuned to the nighttime world, and that, of course, means particularly the eyes. When you look at the eyes of the cat, they can take in when their irises are fully open up to 50% more light than we can with our eyes. And overall, they can manage on a sixth of the light that we need to be able to see. So when I look out into the dark, I can hardly see anything. But Leroy can make out a great deal more. But one of the things which has enabled him to see so well is that his eyes have sacrificed color by and large to improve on their black and white low light sensitivity. Now, you might think that's a loss, not seeing color. But at this time of night, I can hardly see out any colour at all because the, the light has been drained from the landscape and the colour with it. So gaining on that low light sensitivity is so important. And of course in the cat, the key thing that everyone through history have noted, whether it's back in the times of the ancient Egyptians or the medieval man, whether it was a god or whether it was a devil, was this night reflective eye. And the night reflective eye just is based on a mirror. It's a simple crystal mirror at the back of the eye. So when those low few photons of light are drifting around in the woods and they go through the cat's eyes into the retina, if by chance they go right through and they don't strike a receptor, then they're bounced back on. So they have that wonderful ability to see that much further. But it isn't just eyes. Look at the cat's ears. And when you look at these, the way they can swing round like radar cones, you realize that my paltry total inability to move my ears is so feeble in comparison with the cat's. There are over 20 muscles in each one of Leroy's ears, so he can hone in on anything. But he's also able to detect very high-frequency sound. We always think of the dog having good high-frequency detection because of Shepard's high-pitched whistles. But in reality, of course, the prey of dogs and wolves don't make high-pitched sounds. But cat's prey does, whether it's mice, whether it's birds. So their ears are particularly finely attuned to go in for those frequencies. The cat is superbly able to cope with nighttime hunting.
There is an unmistakable magic about a chinchilla. The coat, with its tipping and those wonderful big eyes, just sets them apart as stars instantly. They are really are charming and gentle cats. But regardless of what type of cat you've decided to go for, whether it's a breed cat like these or whether it's a moggy, how do you sort out which cat of the litter you want, whether it's that one, that one, or this one? Really, you need to give them your own quick health check in some ways. But even before you do that, of course, you need to know what sex it's going to be. So when you pick up your cat, give a discreet look up under the tail. It's slightly harder with a fluffier cat to sort out what's there. But basically, you'll find two apertures. And if they're fairly close together, then it's going to be a female. And if they're further apart, then it's going to be a male. And if you're at all in any doubt as to what further apart or closer together mean, then just look at some of the other ones and you'll soon sort it out. But uh, even experts have been known to make mistakes and Toms sometimes end up getting called Tabithas in their, in their later life. When you've got your cat, though, start looking at the animal. And with eyes like these, you cannot go wrong, can you? Lovely clear eyes, beautiful. But it's important to look at the eyes and very much around the nose as to whether there's any snuffling and so on. And if there is, then perhaps that cat is not for you. But something which I think is as important is looking into the ears. When you look in there, make sure that there's no sign of any mites, that there's no sign of any wax. Because if there is, and you have to treat it, you get some drops from your vet, Imagine what goes on. You take your lovely kitten home, and it's settling down with you, and the first thing that happens is you're squirting stuff in its ears. And then the next time it meets you, you're squirting stuff in its ears. And farther than this, far from this wonderful bond being developed between yourself and your cat, all that really seems to be going on is that, well, the cat thinks you're not a very nice person at all. So it doesn't really help matters from the beginning. So if you can avoid that, then it's better to do so. As well, when you're looking at the animal, look at the coat. But the coat, of course, on all of these lovely chinchillas here is stunning. Um, there's no sign, of course, here of any parasites. There's no sign of any fleas. So I think from our general look at you, you're looking quite good. Looking at the mouth as well, check there's no redness. But really, with a cat as healthy as this, how can you go wrong? Your new home. Yeah. Here, yeah, it is. This is your new owner. There you are, Eve. Your new kitten. <laughs> when you get your cat or kitten back home, you must, of course, have already gone out and got the litter trays and all the proper preparations. You shouldn't do that after you've got your, your cat or your kitten there. But Eve has gone the sensible route. She is wanting to have two cats in her household. And sure, you can introduce one when one is older and one is younger. But it's always just so much easier, if that's really what you want to do, to start off with them both as kittens. Because even if they're not litter mates, they'll believe they're litter mates, and they'll grow up, and it'll be a much more harmonious household for the rest of the life of them and yourself while you're together. But if you are introducing a cat who is an adult to an existing adult in a house, that, of course, is quite the other extreme and you can have fisticuffs between the cats because the resident cat is the resident cat. Its scent is everywhere, it knows it's in ownership, and if a new cat comes in, oh, it shouldn't be there. So how can you get around that? Well, one way which works very well is have them meet without meeting. Keep your own cat out of an area for a while, allow the new cat in and around so it can leave its scent, and then take that cat away, and the resident cat comes in, sniffs around and realizes there's another cat there. If you keep doing this time after time, gradually the resident cat realizes that there is a cat there which has a right to be there. And if you monitor carefully what you're doing, and particularly when they first start to meet, do it on a gentle and careful way, then later on you will have far less trouble between the two. And things should settle down quite well. But certainly, if you want to go for the easy route, the way Eva's gone is probably the simplest. An additional way of introducing an adult cat into a home is to put it in a basket, preferably after allowing it and the resident cat to have alternately established their scents first. The role of the basket in keeping them near yet separate 
is particularly useful when introducing a dog and cat. They can gradually habituate to one another in safety, but the calmness of the owner is one of the single most important factors in a successful introduction. The resident animal will trust its owner, but you'll need to spend time developing a relationship with the new animal to allow it to relax in its new home, in your company, and in that of your existing pets. But don't forget to reassure your resident cat so that it does not feel too stressed or alienated by the intruder. This is a little two and a half week old Burman kitten, just beginning to look out at the world. And when kittens are this age, they haven't yet developed their full repertory of language. And by about the time they're 12 weeks old, really, they'll have mastered most of the calls and noises that they're going to make. Now, many people underestimate the language of cats as they underestimate the language of most animals assuming with species snobbery that we have, that we, of course, are the only things that can speak properly. Well, to do that is to really dismiss an awful lot, because in cats, as in many animals, you've got a mixed language. Some of it does have a specific meaning in sound, and some of it, of course, is conveyed by body movements. But there's quite a lot in cat speech that happens with very specific sounds. There's at least 16 different sounds that are a very unambiguous meaning. There are some which are very clear. The loud, deep, distressed howl of a cat once heard, never forgotten. Um, similarly, the hisses, the shrieks, the snarls of cats in a fight. Those are clear messages. But for many people, it's just meow. That's all a cat seems to say when it's in the other range. Well, that's not true at all. And if you're somebody like me who spent many years studying the feral cats around our cities in different parts of the world, you'll realize that, of course, cats do have a very definite range of sounds which they use on specific occasions. But these are the low-key, quiet sounds that they make amongst themselves, and they do manage to communicate in that way. But the intriguing thing is that when cats move in with us, they still make that same repertoire of low-key sounds, but they realize we're a vocal animal. And very, very cleverly, the cat turns up the volume. And so although it's basically still using that same repertoire of low-key sounds, they're all on loud. And so when we go around and interact with our cat, back comes that noise to us. But do remember that the whole thing about cat communication is that it is two-way. And when our cats speak to us, and they sit by a fridge and use the body language of wrapping around our legs and requesting food from us, we are also involved in that because we ourselves tend to use repeat sounds. We tend to say, here, come on, come on, come on, come on, but because the cat basically has trained us into giving the sound that it will respond to. And so because it responds, we use it time after time. So it's a mutual training of both cat and people. And every time that happens around the fridge, we recognize it, the cat recognizes it over food. Similarly, there's that power trip of cat sitting by a door demanding that we open it for us. And if there is a more clear communication between a cat and a person, I get to find it. Until relatively recently, it would only really be breeders who would confine cats like this for obvious reasons when you've got stud animals. But to people like myself who worry about animals' behavior, there's been an alarming increase over the last 15 or so years of confining more house cats within the buildings. Now, that's been happening in both America and in Britain. And the problem really is that it's suddenly robbing those cats of an inheritance of about three and a half thousand years since they were domesticated of the outside world. And in that outside world where they were having the enriching experience of running around, chasing after things, suddenly if that's removed and they're enclosed with you, all of that of course has to focus on you. And that can then lead to problems. 
Now, you know whether in your area you're worried about traffic and whether traffic density is too much. You can make those decisions. But in general, it's much better for the animal if they can have a more diffused life. Because density causes problems. If your own cat is trapped in the house, that in a way is increasing its density. It's bottling the, the situation up. But if you're increasing that with a number of other cats as well, then cat density causes serious problems of stress where you have fouling, you have spraying, you have aggression. And all of that can really be dissipated if they can be given more area. Remember always, of course, if you are having problems, there may be a veterinary reason. So check with the vet first. And remember, of course, early conditioning can give you a problem which can be of long standing. But really, the growing need today is to address that enclosing of cats, which is leading to a high amount of stress and confinement. If you've got as active cats as these little Burmese that are into absolutely everything, then the chances are, if they're indoor cats, you will also have some damage to your furniture. The outdoor cat, when it goes out, will scratch on a tree. And when it scratches on a tree, it's not just sharpening its claws, and taking the exercise, of course, it's also leaving a message. It's part of this scent marking that's going on because cats have slightly smelly feet. But to draw the attention of other cats to that, to investigate it, when they go through and scratch, of course, there's a slightly frayed surface and that draws other cats and that draws the cat itself back to that same spot. And so it remarks and remarks. Now, in your house, that's exactly what happens. The outside world comes in to the inside world on the end of your sofa. This is an ideal surface for a cat to want to go around and mark, and they will gladly claw in there. But if you leave it too late until there is actually a marking surface there, which will draw the cats back to it each time, then it's your fault. And it is totally pointless yelling at them and trying to stop them once it has begun, because it is crying out to come back and be reused. So what you have to do if you find that beginning to occur, of course, is the old standby of changing the geography works superbly well here. Just hide it, mask it in some other way while you're trying to dissuade the cat. So that instantly gets rid of half the problem. You can also use other passive means in the sense of putting something there, such as a cut orange that you don't like, or some smelling uh, wax if it was onto a wooden furniture surface, something that really they find less attractive. But what the cat is doing here is really the real answer. You don't just wish to change the geography and passively move them away. You wish to redirect them. Now, most people misunderstand the use of scratching posts. What you need to do is actually, you know, just once you get clawing on there, put the scratching post somewhere in front. And then when the cat starts scratching on your furniture, you just gently transpose the cat onto here. And really, you don't want brand new scratching posts because there's nothing really to draw the cat. So have it that's already been scratched on there. And you can always attract your cat's attention as well. And with luck, after a little while, yes, you're up there, aren't you? And that starts getting used rather than your furniture. If you and your cats live in an area like this where there's quite a few cats around, because the gardens are not too big, the housing is close enough that make territories squeak together, then you can get little territorial scraps outside. Occasionally, they can be quite severe. And in situations like that, it's sensible if your cat at least has a key on its collar so it would be able to have a secure place inside. But remember, aggression isn't just in the outside world. It happens indoors as well. These two cats, as you can see, do not like each other. They live in the same house, they have to get along somehow, and they mainly do it by avoiding each other. One of the problems is most of the time when you have situations like this, it's because people have too many cats in the same household. And yet remarkably, this is sister and brother of the same litter. Now you can behaviorally change things. You can by being very calming and soothing and gentle gradually spend time with them and get them to relax and calm down. There we go. There's one. There we go. But it can be a long uphill struggle if you're just trying to force too many cats into one space. 
but don't mistake real aggression for the biff, the baff spats that you can get between any couple of cats that live in a house where you're just getting a bit of juvenile behavior, a bit of leftover teenage play where they go baff, 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 and quietly settle down, but the rest of the time are the best of friends. People often misinterpret this piece of behavior as if it's serious aggression because they've been sitting down and they've been playing gently with their cat and suddenly people will say, I've got a psychopath for a cat because the cat seems to abruptly turn on them. In reality, what's happened is you've been stroking your cat and you've heightened its senses and then there's something about your movements. Your hand has suddenly loomed over their face or their body and they're triggered into a defensive mode. They feel as if they're being attacked and their response is to grab you around the wrist and to kick with their feet against the back of your arm, almost as if you are prey or a, a, some aggressor who's coming for them and they're having to defend themselves totally. When you've got a situation like that, the simplest thing to do is just to stop. Either get up and walk away, or if it's going on your hand, then just pretend you're dead. And if you need to go further than that, we'll distract the cat with the other hand, and it will stop. But in general, if your cat has free access to the outside world, many problems either don't occur or are much less of a nuisance. But if your cat is confined, you can put more interest and entertainment into its indoor life by playing with it and providing a cat gym, which allows the arboreal cat to climb and its pretend tree not only reduces boredom and so cuts problems, but gives it more room to play. If you've just moved house with a cat, or have a new young cat, after you've kept them in for a week or so to become attached to the new home, when you first let them out into the garden, you need to stay with them, preferably keeping them on a lead while they establish a map in their mind of how to get back to the safety of the house. Let them out alone too soon, and they could become lost if they're startled by something, like the neighbor's dogs on venturing into the next garden. The neighbor's dogs may have turned into a pack, but trees offer a safe haven for climbing cats. And once the dogs have gone, the cat comes down and fortunately finds its way home. Thanks, Ed. The one thing you won't do by putting a lead onto a cat is to turn it, of course, into a dog and be able to walk it in quite the same way. But it is useful, even if you've got a cat, if you're, for example, a breeder, and your cat never goes into the outside world, or you're somebody who believes in keeping your cats in all the time, even so, it's extremely useful to have the facility to have your cat in the outside world. Now, the problem for most people who keep their cats in all the time is that when the cat is out, it is liable to be startled by something. Not having a familiar map of the area in its mind, it may well disappear. And similarly, if you're going with your cat to the vets or you're visiting relatives, Again, there are reasons why at some time in your cat's life you will need to be able to restrain it and have it fitted with something like a leash or to be able to put it into a basket and put it in the car. These are things that you need to think out ahead and think it out with your cat ahead rather than just think, oh, I'm now going and suddenly put it on because what usually happens with most cats is they fight the harness when it's first put on and if the very first time you put it on is in the outside world, then the cat can squirm out of the harness and get away and escape. And you may not be able to get it back. If that does happen, of course, be calm and gradually move towards your cat. But the real answer is realize that you will need these at some stage in your cat's life and get it used to it. Initially, put on the harness. The cat may not like it. You can leave it without the leash. In your own house, you can put the leash down and let the cat wander around. And if you do that, then the cat is not having this feeling of being trapped by it, and gradually over a period of time it will get used to having the harness there behind you, and all will be well. And the exact same logic applies to carriers. Don't just throw your cat in when you need it. Do it well ahead. 
put the cat in when you are sitting around having a cup of tea and don't try and shut it in. The cat would just get used to it as a little basket and from time to time shut the door, walk it around the house and gradually build it up to that point. The same with your car, introduce it, don't drive the car anywhere and gradually all of these things by habituation get the cat to a point that they don't get into an excited state because one of the real problems that you have to face is taking your cat to the vet from time to time. And if you're taking a stressed animal on top of any injury, then you do have a problem. So reduce the stress by thinking ahead. <laughs> As you can see, Ko is a very lively vermin. And vermins tend to be because they have not only a traditional build, but a traditional coat. And a traditional coat can be very useful if you want to be a little more active. They do have the advantage as well for us in enabling us not to have to go through a daily ritual every single day to comb them. Because by having the traditional type of coat, it is something that will self-align. And in that self-alignment, you don't need all of the tender, loving activity of this comb. But do bear in mind that as well as the spines of the comb, the cat's tongue has spines itself. And it's those very spines that have had to look after all of the traditional type of cat, whether long-haired or short-haired, before mankind really got involved with cat breeding. And so any of the more traditional type of cats, albeit long hair, and that includes the sort of smaller, lighter-bodied ones like the Angora, or the great big, really rugged ones from the north, up in the cold and snow, where the farm edge of work made them into animals that had to look after themselves. Now, that includes ones like the Norwegian Forest Cat or the Maine Coon. Now, they went through centuries without ever being brushed or combed, so they don't really require too rigorous an attention today. And if you want a coat that will look after itself and a long hair, great, they're a lovely one to go for. But if you don't mind spending time on a daily basis with a fuller-coated cat, then the modern person can be for you. But don't underestimate the amount of time that it will need. And remember as well that we've modified the skull structure of the modern Persian by flattening the face. The tear ducts don't drain as well as they used to, so tears will come over and you'll get matting on the fur just under the eyes, and that will need attention too. But again, if that's the type of cat that you're very happy to go for and have the time, then why not? But if against either of that or the other long hairs, you really want something that you consider much more practical, a short hair cat, well, there's a great range, of course, again, from the Siamese through to the good old domestic Tom. And again, that's an animal that has looked after itself through the centuries without any attention from brushes, and the licking has been quite sufficient to clean it. But that doesn't mean you should never brush them, because it can be quite a useful indicator of whether there are things like parasites around. So put a square of white paper down, put your cat on the paper, brush away from time to time, and if you find any black flecks the telltale droppings of fleas, you will have to look after both your cat and your house. Life is not always emotionally easy, and pets can provide non-threatening companionship. We tell them all our woes, and they don't sit in judgment. And they're always there for us. In the world of childhood, Cats can take on a significant role. But the quiet friend on whom love and trust can be confidently confided. This is PBS.